Voglio un brownie, so scimica. C'è qualcuno là fuori? C'è qualcuno là fuori? Benvenuti al Christian Podcast. Oh, 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 oh. Ti sei da That's right, my friends. Welcome to season number two of Christian Podcast. We're live from Costa Mesa, California. Maybe not when you're listening. My name is Beto Gudiño, and I am El Comunicador. Yes, sir. So, I'm Beto Gudiño, and today we have an awesome topic that I want you guys to listen to this episode. We're going to get to it. We're probably going to start with the story of our guest today, and then we're going to move on towards the end of the episode to more of the detailed questions about the topic of adoption. So, we have an expert today named Josh Harrison. He's my friend. He lives here in Costa Mesa. We are broadcasting live right now from one of our favorite coffee shops, right? And if you're watching us, we are cheering right now with our coffee in hand. <laughs> All right, so I met, I met you, Josh, um, kind of recently, but I knew about you from from an old church I used to go to called Rock Harbor here in Costa Mesa and I mean I kind of knew about your story back then sure because you would preach you would come on stage and you know teach the Bible and you know at some point you mentioned that you were thinking about adopting kids mm -hmm. and then eventually you know the story came you know fulfilled with yeah. now we have children who were adopted and this was I don't know a few years back Um, you'll probably you know, elaborate a little more on that. <laughs> sure. But here's the thing. I want to talk about a little bit about your story and what's the heart of adoption when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to God. And, you know, I was even thinking about this thing where Jesus says, I won't leave you as orphans. Right. Right. So there's a lot of um, adoption in the Bible. It's just like throughout. Yeah. Right. And I want to bring that like, what does that look like today? And I mean, I say you're an expert because you have three kids sure. who were adopted. And as I was uh, looking online on, you know, where <laughs> on Google, yeah. uh, I was typing a few questions like, like, how do people go about this? Like, what is the first question that people think of when it comes to adopting uh, or deciding to adopt? Like some of the questions that I found, I'm like, wow. This is so interesting because they, they were like super plain and simple. Like, can I adopt a kid from Africa? Sure. Can I adopt a kid from Latin America? Yeah. How much yeah. does it cost yep. to adopt? Right. And of course, there's many more questions that we can tackle today. But Josh, first, why don't we talk about a little bit about your story, like who you are? Yeah. Um, what's your heart um, for like, your heart? Because I know you're a pastor. So what's your heart for for people? Yeah. So tell us a little bit about yeah. you. Thanks for having me. Excited to be on the show today. Um, yeah. So Beto said my name is Josh. I'm pastor here in Costa Mesa of a church called Canopy that meets like like a mile away from where we're sitting right now, which is awesome. Um, I am married to my wife, Heather. We've been married for 22 years. Uh, we have three kids, uh, all adopted. So we have a, a, an 18-year-old who's in college now. It's a freshman in college, which is kind of freaking me out um but she, she's doing well i've got a, a junior in high school and then i've got a seven-year-old little little boy so two girls and a boy um and yeah you know i've been i have been living in this community for the better part of 25 years now here in costa mesa wow. and uh pastoring in this community for i don't know 15 let's call it something like that nice yeah, yeah. <laughs> And no, I just love, um, I mean, I love the city we get to live in. I love uh, a lot of, uh, yeah, I love a lot of the opportunities that God puts in front of his church here in this area. Um, yeah, it's a really unique kind of context uh, as far as like people. I just think um, a friend of mine says the meaning of life is relationship. 
and I think he's on to something there. Uh, obviously, all stemming from our relationship. I like with, that. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. All stemming from our relationship with God, but then also just our relationships with one another. Um, and so I love just being in a relationship with people, getting to walk alongside them. Um, I don't mentor people or disciple people. I just walk with people, and people walk with me, and we grow together. And that's what I love about being a pastor. Love it. Yeah, love man. it. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I'm just going to start with a kind of funny story. And I told you this before. Yeah. But I came from, um, well, here in the U.S. Because I've been in so many churches because I grew up in Mexico yep. uh, for the first 24 years of my life. And then I came here and I started going to a Hispanic church mm -hmm. for the most part of like my early U.S. years. And eventually we ended up. No, going to Rock Harbor where you were one of the teaching pastors and I remember uh, my mom you know like she she kind of grew up in her faith in this other Hispanic church yeah and to her she just had a really really hard time like moving to a different church oh, yeah. right and for totally. us to move she was like almost to the point of like saying you guys are in sin you yeah. know I mean yeah. th that's sinful to, right. to move I don't know maybe maybe some people could be <laughs> right about that um But I remember, you know, we brought her to one of the, the meetings at, you know, back in the days, Rock Harbor. And you were teaching. And I remember she was, like, paying attention to your teaching. And, and at the end, she almost, like, gave an assessment yeah? of your teaching. All right. Right? So a rating. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so if we could rate with emojis, she gave you a divine emoji, Ooh. right? Like, she's like, but with a little bit of a skeptical emoji okay because she was like right she was like i think you know i think he's no he's a godly man but uh, there's still something funky about being <laughs> in this other place fair right? enough <laughs> yeah that, that's it i mean I'll, i'll take it yeah i'll take it take yeah. what i can get your All mom right. sounds like a wise woman yeah she is <laughs> for sure man i had to to think about that but no mom i love you you are so smart and i'm your son So I love you. Um, okay. So tell us a little bit about, before we go into the topic of today, yeah. um, like what's your, how do you, how did you become a pastor? Like you could summarize it. I know oh, no, the story is going to be probably super long, Yeah. but how can you summarize the heart of this is what I want to do in life yeah. versus you know, whatever else you could do? Yeah. I'll give you the, the very quick version. So when I was a kid, I mean, grew up in the church and I felt like from an early age, I had people telling me. Hey, you should be a pastor. I feel like, you know, Christians use this language of calling. God has a calling on your life. And, um, yeah, as I started, you know, growing up a little bit, high school, college, thinking about my, my vocation, I just didn't have any interest. It didn't, it wasn't that like I was afraid of it. You know, people, some people talk about running away from ministry. I just wasn't interested. You know, I'd been around the church. I liked the church, but it just felt like, you know, oh, dealing with people all day long, you know, dealing with problems and, you know, the life of the church and the politics and all that just wasn't of interest to me. And then, um, honestly, God just kind of used a bunch of circumstances to change my mind about it. I mean, I, I had graduated from college with a degree in English. I thought I wanted to go into, um, into teaching at a college level. And, uh, while I was kind of spinning my wheels waiting to go to grad school, I, I happened to be working at a college on a college campus and I had free to free tuition. So I just started randomly taking classes for fun, and I took a, I, I stumbled into a Hebrew class that I thought would be really fun, and it turned out to be really fun, and ended up kind of leading me down this this road of biblical studies and scholarship, and then ended up getting involved in some missional opportunities that got me walking one on one with uh, with students, discipling students, um, and before I knew it, like I was kind of as a result of those opportunities, was offered a job, um, kind of discipling students through short term missions. And it turned out to be like a vocational ministry job. I didn't realize it at the time, but I stepped into this ministry job where I was hanging out with people on a daily basis. I was, you know, prepping and preaching sermons. I was, oh, goodness, I just hit the microphone. Sorry about that. We good, man. All right. <laughs> uh, sending people out on, on, on short-term mission, debriefing, all this stuff, you know. And um, like my, well, within a week of being on the job, I was like, this is incredible. Like, this is what I feel like I was made to do. And I came to realize it was just pastoring. Like it was in a, it was, it wasn't in a church context at the time like it is now, but, um, yeah, I just, I, I had this sense of like, this is what I want to do with my life. You know, I just get to have meaningful conversations with people about what God's doing in their life, teach the word of God, pray for them, empower and equip them into mission in their daily lives. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's what I get to do. 
So, how are you doing so far? Are you still <laughs> enjoying that? Um, oh man! Do, do you wish you could change a few things, or? No, you know, it's been uh, it's been an interesting season uh, to be a pastor. You know, with COVID, with a lot of political stuff, with racial stuff, uh, and I'm, I'm leading a, a church plant, uh, so. That brings its own set of challenges because I don't get to just pastor. I also have to be like a, you know, a, a graphic designer and a, an accountant and all sorts of other things to help keep a small church running. Um, hmm. And I had some moments, if I'm being honest, I had a couple moments in the last year or so where I wasn't ready to walk away, but I understood why pastors do. Hmm. It was hard, you know, like this really hard season in the life of the church where you have people leaving all the time upset about, you know, you said this and it upset me or you didn't say this and it upset me and, you know, you with the COVID stuff, this made me mad. And it was just like, and then on top of it all, we're all remote. You know, <laughs> we couldn't even see people in person. So like that, that face to face relational element was just gone. And yeah, I, I, like I said, I never was ready to walk away. Like I, I still love what I do. I still feel called to it as hard as it can be sometimes, but I get why pastors burn out. Like I totally do. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's so good. And maybe at some other point we can talk about, you know, burning out, That would be sure. the burning out episode. I've been reading this book just kind of like in the parenthesis. Yeah. I don't know if you read it called The Way of the Lamb, The Way of the Dragon. Yeah, yeah. Jamie Goggins. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's a little bit about, uh, well, I mean, we could derail right here. Sure. Not going to talk about it. But um, yeah, very interesting mm -hmm. about you know, the work pastors do and yep. then how it can get into burnout and whatnot. Yep. Um, and many other things. But That'll be another episode because this another one, one we want to talk about adoption. And mm -hmm. I guess what interested, uh, what got me interested in the topic is that you were like the first person that I've ever heard of. And I, I mean, I feel like I have, I had a relationship with you. It's kind of weird because you were the pastor and in a mega church, you, <laughs> you don't get to talk to a pastor that much. Yeah, that's a bummer. Um, that's a bummer. <laughs> But at the same time, on my end, I feel like I did know you. Sure. Yeah, you heard right? my story a lot. Yeah. Uh -huh. I so knew I, who you were too, by the way. You did? Oh, yeah. I heard about you. Yeah. I heard about this guy, Beto, all the time. Okay. Good yeah. things, I bet. Always. Uh, <laughs> always. <laughs> okay. So, um, I kind of knew your story and it impacted me when, when uh, one day you brought your kids on the stage. Yeah. And you said, you know, it's finally realized, like, we adopted, these are our kids, we're yeah. going to love on them. Um, so there's a lot of questions that I kind of have, and I think I have a heart for people that have a heart for adoption. Sure. And I want this episode to kind of, like, resolve some of their main questions. Yeah. Right? So I want to, today, I want to talk about, like, what is helpful to ask, what is unhelpful to ask. Yeah, that's great. Um, what are some of the taboos when it comes to adopting Um, are there any statistics you know, about adoption? Uh, sure. What is the heart of God when it comes to adoption? So yeah. all these questions that I have in my mind, and I guess the first one would be along these lines, like, um, what does the, I mean, the easier one is, what does the Bible say about adoption? Oh, gosh. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is what led my wife and I into adoption in the first place, was really considering what the Bible said. I had a friend who challenged me to think through that very question um he was the first person i'd met in my life who was adopting uh, as a as his first choice i know there are other people who've done it but the first person i met you know most people that i had known prior to that came to adoption through infertility or or some other means which i'm a big advocate of adoption however people get there whether it's their plan a or their plan z you know um But this was the first guy I met that said, this is our plan A. And I, I just kind of asked why, like, what's, what's the deal with that? And he said, essentially the question you asked me, well, have you ever read what the Bible says about adoption? And I couldn't say that I had. And so he led me through some stuff and I did some of my own research and I found that like adoption, I mean, the adoption language is a big deal in the New Testament, which we'll talk about in a second. But the idea of caring for the vulnerable is everywhere in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, you know? It's funny, in this last couple of years, this word justice has come up a lot in the church in different contexts. Um, and sometimes, you know, depending on the tradition of church you're from, it's negative or positive, depending on mm. what you're looking at. And I, yeah. I get frustrated with that because the Old Testament talks about justice on almost every page. And justice in the Old Testament is caring for, for the vulnerable. Uh, and the Old Testament has this, this, this specific understanding of what the vulnerable looks like. You know, it's for them, it's... Uh, widows 
mm-hmm. orphans, which the Old Testament calls fatherless, um, uh, immigrants, and the poor. Um, so strangers, foreigners, and the poor. Um, and you look at that and you just kind of say, okay, fatherless is one of the main categories that the Old Testament seems to, that, that the law, the Torah says we should care for. Then you get into like the, the prophets and the prophets are like ripping into Israel because they didn't do it. Mm. And you see that like God cares a great deal about this. You know, some of the passages that for me were the most enlightening were, you know, there's this passage in, um, I'm going to get my references all wrong, but I think in Jeremiah, where Jeremiah is talking about this king, you know, uh, King Josiah. You getting this right? I think I, this is. I think so, man. I th- yeah, come on, yeah. Bible scholars. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I'm going to I'm going to quote Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and I always get them reversed in my mind. But I think Jeremiah is the one who talks about um, talks about Josiah, and he's basically, you know, Josiah is this famous king. He became king when he's a little kid, when he was 18. Discovered a scroll of God in the temple and realized that they weren't living up to the to the Torah, so he tears his clothes, declares a like national revival, like changes the whole country, all this sort of stuff. And he's often commended as like this hero for that. Um, but Jeremiah, I think the prophet asked the question. Um, it, it, I'll, I'll, I'll butcher the, the exact quote, but basically he's, he's saying like, what did, what did Josiah do right? You know? And the answer comes back from the Lord. Good King Josiah, he defended the cause of the poor and the needy. Is this not what it means to know me? That, that line right there just crushes me. Is this not what it ne- means to know me, says the Lord? Defend mm. the cause of the poor and the needy. And when you have that, that, the Old Testament context, that means, like I said, widows, orphans, immigrants, primarily, mm. and vulnerable. And so that's what Josiah did right. I mean, he had this national revival. He, you know, tore down idols. He did all this great stuff. But at the end of the day, what, what, what the answer comes back from God is he was just. He, he cared for the vulnerable. And then you go to Ezekiel, and Ezekiel's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom specifically on the other side, which we know Sodom is famous for its sexual sin and getting burned down with fire and brimstone. And, and the prophet there is asking the question, like, what did they do wrong? <laughs> you know, and God's answer is they were arrogant, overfed and unconcerned. It doesn't say anything about sexual, sexual sin there, although that was a real thing. Arrogant, overfed and unconcerned. They did not care for the poor and the needy. Wow. That's what God judges Sodom for. It's not just the sex stuff that we all like to talk about as Christians, but they didn't care for the vulnerable. Um, and so you look at that and you're like, okay. Obviously, God cares, cares about this a great deal, so much so that in my mind, um, as I read the Old Testament, I was told as a kid that idolatry is the sin that God hates the most mm. and that he will over and over again threaten to like withdraw his presence from his people on the basis of their idolatry. But well, we see the same thing as true of injustice, that those two things go together in the mind of God. Idolatry, so idolatry and injustice. And those are the two things that, to my knowledge, somebody might correct me, are the only two things in the Old Testament where God says, I don't want to hear you. I'm going to withdraw my blessing and my presence because you're not doing these things. And one of them is caring for the, vul- for the vulnerable, which in our world and in their world definitely involved orphans, fatherless, um, as a massive component. And then you get to the New Testament and that picture just gets like, Amplified, It just gets enlarged like massively. I mean, the famous verse in James where James says, um, religion that God our Father considers as pure and faultless Mm. is this, to care for widows and orphans in their distress and to keep oneself from being corrupted by the world. That's famous. But if you start looking at, like you said, you referenced Paul in the book of Romans um, or, or Jesus in the book of John. I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Like this adoption language is the language that God actually uses to communicate uh, what he's done for us. And so... It's, it's not just, um, it's really fascinating, and we found this to be true in our own experience, that, that adoption is both um, the outworking of the gospel, like if you have received the gospel, this is something you step into, you care for the vulnerable, you care for the poor, you care for the orphan, but it's also a, like a way into the gospel, it's a way of understanding the gospel and what God has done for us. And that's what we found to be true, and this is probably answering another question, but like when Jesus says, I won't leave you as orphans, I will come to you, the process of adopting for us has made that more real in our lives. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Or when Paul says, um, the spirit you've received doesn't make you slaves so you live live in fear again, but rather the spirit you've received has brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry out the Father. Like that happens in my house. Mm -hmm. An adopted son calling me dad. You know? And that just makes the gospel so alive. So it's this really like, it's because we've received the gospel, we live this out. And because we live it out, we receive the gospel more and more. So it's, I mean, 
you can't you can't possibly overstate the importance of, of adoption in the in the in the biblical story for sure. Wow, that's that's amazing, man. Uh, as you're talking, what's coming to my mind is so like the other day I had an episode with a philosopher, a t uh, professor of philosophy, and I was talking about we were talking about like what are the why do people don't believe in God? And one of the reasons is like well people some people don't believe in God because they don't. They cannot understand that that God could be good, right? right? So there's this thing called the problem of evil, right? And I feel like, in a sense, what you're talking about, you know, when God defends the cause of the poor and the needy and the vulnerable, it's almost like, okay, let's let's move on from the problem of evil. It's there, but this solves um, or this answers the question is god good at least in my yeah. in my case i feel like this is this makes sense yeah you know, is god good well he is good and he's going to showcase his goodness through people who care yes for the needy and the vulnerable well that's the crazy part is the the bible calls in the old testament literally calls god the father to the fatherless it says he he clothes the or he feeds the hungry he clothes the naked he cares for the vulnerable and you ask the question like how does he do that you know and it's clear that the way he does it is through his people Like that's, that's his plan A to work in the world is to work through people. And so when he calls himself the father to the fatherless, what he's saying is I have chosen this population as my own. I have placed my special protection over them. And therefore, if you are one of my people, they are now under your special protection as well. That's what it means to be the people of God. That's why God has a people so that they can reflect his priorities. Mm. And one thing that we see without fail over and over again from The beginning of the Bible to the very end is that one of God's priorities is the fatherless. And if we're his people, then they are under our protection as well. Wow. I yeah. love it. Man, that is ah, just so helpful. Um, I feel like that's that's kind of like solves the where, where, where can we see the heart of adoption in the Bible? And sure. it's really the heart of God and it's the call to his people to live out his goodness. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's so cool, man. So let's talk about a little bit of the, the needy and greedy. Like, how did that end up happening for you? Like, yeah. what were some of the first questions that you were asking when when you decided to adopt? And also, you know, I mean, the fact that you, like you were saying, you know, it, it was uh, your first choice. Like, you could have had, yeah. you no know, kids. Yeah. Um, but you decided not to, and you decided to adopt. Like, how did you, tr how did you end up, like, deciding, yes? Yeah. Like I said, this friend of mine was the first person that I'd ever heard that kind of language from, and it intrigued me. Uh, and my wife and I were fairly young married at the time. We were 26, 27, hadn't, hadn't had biological kids yet, hadn't really tried to. Um, and yeah, I was intrigued by that idea. I didn't really talk to my wife about it because I was also a little bit scared. Um, And then, you know what it was? it was? It was, he challenged me to read the Bible and see what the Bible said, and I did. I did. I read through it. I, I studied. I listened to different people talk about what the Bible says about adoption. Um, but it really, like, caught fire in our lives when we kind of saw some of the need firsthand. So my wife and I got to a chance through the, the ministry job I was telling you about before to lead a team of students to an orphanage in Africa, which was just a kind of a game-changing experience for us to see what like I mean obviously we could have seen it here as well we just didn't have eyes to see it but to go to that context and see what fatherlessness and 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 what it means to be a vulnerable child with no rights no protections in the world and while we were both there God kind of spoke independently to each of us and one night I remember we were we were chatting kind of debriefing the day and my wife just said I, I don't feel like we can leave these kids and that's where I kind of said yeah I've been you know it's weird that you say that like I've been thinking the same kind of thing for the last year and haven't really known how to talk about it um but maybe we shouldn't leave them you know like i, I didn't mean stay in africa although whatever god wants to do but I, i meant like maybe like caring for the fatherless is for us and the more we prayed about it the like more clearly we heard we heard god say like i want this to be your plan a i want this to be how you build your family specifically the 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 wording that came to our hearts was we want your home to be a place where orphans become sons and daughters um and so that's how we built our family yeah Wow, that's incredible. And when you say what was, so what are some of the taboos when it comes to thinking about adoption? You you mentioned the word, you know, I was a little, like scary. Like what was scary oh, about sure. like even thinking about it or committing to a decision? Like what are some of the things you think people go through? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's all sorts of different 
ideas. First of all, it's not the most common way of building a family, uh, which is something I, I would love to see change more and more as more people step into it. And it has changed, actually, even in the last decade uh, a little bit. Um, but I think, um, I think people, for the most part, understand the, the notion of, of having a biological child. Like, they, they get that the process in which you go through and all that sort of stuff. Like, even if you haven't done it, you get the idea of, like, doctor's visits and Lama's classes and, you know, on and on and yeah. on. Uh, with adoption, I, I don't think most people understand how the process works or even the ways, you know, there are different ways you can adopt. And so there's, there's a little bit of, like, the fear of the unknown. Um, and then there's also a stigma with it. Like, I, I think... Well, several stigmas. I mean, I think one of them is that it's like a, a, it's only a plan B option. Like the only reason anybody would ever possibly do it is if you couldn't have a, a kid another way. Uh, and like I said, I don't care how people arrive at adoption. So I'm an advocate of people who've, uh, you know, tried to have a child biologically not able to. I'm an advocate of adoption no matter how you get there. But I think one of the things I want to shift in, in my ministry and my life is helping people understand it doesn't have to be your plan B or C or whatever else. It can be a plan A. If you read the Bible clearly, I think for more Christians, it should be a plan A. So helping to take away that, that, that plan A or plan B mentality also helps to take away the stigma of somehow it's a less than experience. Because if you think about it, if adoption is only a plan B, then that means it's second best. Like, mm. I always want to try this first. Yeah. And if this doesn't work, Ooh. I'm super disappointed, then I'll go to this as like my backup plan. Mm. And when you have that second best mentality, then it just creates all sorts of problems because you have mm. like... I mean, classically, you have stories, you know, of, of parents who hide adoption from their kids because they don't want their kids to feel second best, like, like it's something to be ashamed of. We shouldn't talk about this in front of the kids. We don't want them to know they're adopted. Or, you know, you have people coming up and asking questions like, which I did when I was, bef pre like, before we adopted too, like, oh, you guys adopted. That's, that's so nice. Couldn't you have your own kids? You know, that kind of like, mm. this must be some sort of less than experience. What's fascinating mm. is, is I won't get into this too deeply but when the bible talks about adoption when paul talks about adoption in romans 8 or jesus talks about it in john 14 they never that that's not the understanding at all the understanding of adoption in the roman world was not that it was second best experience but that it was actually in some ways more significant than a biological child mm. um and i won't get into the weeds of that but um yeah i think that's the biggest thing i think people think that like you're settling like mm -hmm. you only adopt if you have to it's like a Oh, I'm so sorry you had to you had to go about that way. Wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and I think there is also like a, a very real like if you step into it, I don't even know how it would work. Like, mm. and then depending on how you go, there's I mean there's we can talk more about this if you want to, but there's traditionally three ways to adopt. There's kind of domestic private adoption, so from within the U.S. private adoption. There's international private adoption, and then there's foster like adopting through foster care. Mm. And each of them has its own unique challenges that are pretty daunting pretty intimidating uh for somebody stepping in um you know and we could, if you want to get into those challenges i'd be happy to address that as well but yeah well what where, where were some of the challenges you faced yeah um so we you did international we did two different right? yeah we did two different so we my our daughters adopted internationally from ethiopia uh so that was an international private adoption and then our son is adopted through the foster system uh here he's from long beach california mm. um and yeah with uh, the international adoption, I mean, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of red tape, kind of a lot of bureaucracy. You have to navigate lots of processes whenever you're dealing with international uh, anything, honestly, <laughs> you know. Immigration. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, you, yeah. Definitely have probably talked about that on the show before too. Yeah, there's all sorts of challenges there. There's a cost, there's a significant cost involved. Although, strangely, not as significant as, as domestic private adoption. It's more expensive to adopt domestically and internationally, usually. Wow. There's a big time frame involved. I mean, mm. it often will take several years to adopt a child internationally. I had some friends who adopted from China, and I think it took like five years. So, I mean, imagine that. Imagine you have a, you're going to adopt a baby, mm -hmm. and after five years of waiting and trying, you end he's, up with a five-year-old. He's a little kid. Yeah, he's grown up. Yeah. Wow. So, there's, I mean, there's unique challenges there. Um, mm. Beyond that, I mean, I think um, with the foster system, it's a whole different it's a whole different ball game. I mean, honestly, the waiting thing wasn't a thing. Like, we got certified for us. We got certified on a Monday, and on a Tuesday, we got a phone call that there was a, a little one in need of a home. Got that phone call at noon. He was in our house by three o'clock. So there was like no waiting. It was just like wow. this really jarring experience. But that's come with its own challenges. I mean, with international adoption, one of the things that 
This is neither a challenge nor a strength, but it was a little bit cleaner. You adopted the kids. By the time you picked them up, they were yours, like legally. You bring them home and that's that. Whereas with foster system, when they come to your home, they're not legally yours. They're legally somebody mm -hmm. else's or yeah. legally, you know, kind of ward of the state. Or, and so then you spend months, years going through this crazy, like really difficult uh, legal process. And your heart is ripped wide open by the, the like, because you're like, when you foster someone, you're thrust right into the, the depth of their, their own trauma. You know, you meet this kid at their lowest moment. And that doesn't just go away. Like you don't get in a plane and fly to another country. You like live in it with them. And it's, it's crazy difficult. There's all sorts of legal challenges. There's practical challenges of having social worker in and out of your house every week. Like, um, you know, so it's, it's, yeah, every, every way you go about adoption is both the most difficult thing and the most beautiful thing that we've ever experienced, no matter how you go about it. So, yeah. Wow. That's, that's amazing, man. I mean, I'm thinking right now, like, I mean, there's a, you know, maybe, I don't know if this is kind of silly, right? But uh, have you ever seen like movies of people adopting and then there's a little bit of this stigma, like what if the kids turn out, you know, they have a, a DNA that's, yeah, sure. that's bad or things like that. And, and there's a stigma. So yeah. what, what would you say are some of the no or creates drama and things like that do, do you have you experienced like was that real for you or do you think like man i mean it kind of depends or is that just like a fake scenario no um, no i mean no that's yeah that's a total thing like you never know i mean the first thing to say is you never know what you're going to get no matter how you go about parenting like even if you go about it biologically you're never really sure what's going to come out right yes parenting is we like to be in control and there's nothing about parenting that's in our control Oh, yeah. you know, you know um, wow. that said though, like there is a very, at least in the case of biological parenting, most of the problems you encounter are, are of your own making. Like, you know what I mean? Like you're the one that screwed up the kid. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're coming to you and, and their, their challenges in life that the parent, the person they're going to talk to about their, their, you know, with their therapist someday is you like, or, you know, whereas when you adopt, sometimes you're inheriting stuff that other people have done. You're inheriting Uh, generational curses maybe from another family you know you're inheriting words that have been spoken or actions that have been done by someone else um, you know yeah. th there's a saying in the adoption community that, that these are kids from hard places and when you when you when you have a child biologically there's no backstory the backstory is I fell in love with my wife and we had a kid and now here's the kid but when you adopt a child you're inheriting a backstory um, and a lot of times they wouldn't be adoptable if the backstory wasn't hard. And so the backstory often comes with trauma. You know, I think of, of our son who, wow. he, you know, there are ways of scoring trauma, like of, of like grading the level of trauma. And, you know, you can ask questions like, have you ever, you know, seen violence in your home? Have you ever been hurt by someone who's supposed to love you? Like all this sort of stuff. And I remember we, we, my wife and I took a class once where we were supposed to like grade our own levels of trauma in life. And I went through this sheet. It was like, tick, put a one next to every one of these that applies to you. And I got to the end of it and I had a zero. Like, I'm the least traumatized person in the history of the world. Like, I had... You You're know, a happy I, boy. Yeah, I know. I, I had parents that's, you <laughs> wow. know, that, that cared for me and took care of me and all. Like, I, I'm grateful. Wow. I'm so, Yay for your parents. Yeah, right? I'm kind of soft, but I'm grateful, yeah. you know. <laughs> um, but then we did it for our son. And he, at the time, was two years old and had an eight. Eight of, like, 15 things he'd experienced at two years old. What? And so, yeah, you come with, come with hard stuff and... and And that can't help but shape somebody's personality and somebody's response to life. Now, that said, um, I do believe with all of my being that love is greater than trauma and that love is greater than, well, anything. I mean, you know, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians is one of the only things that lasts, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of the one of the only things that lasts, right? The greatest of these is love. And at the end of the day... I just, I, we haven't yet encountered something with any of our kids that the answer to dealing with the difficult situation wasn't just love them and they're going to be okay and you're going to be okay. Now, I know that's an oversimplification. I know people go through, like adoptive parents go through really hard stuff. But man, at the end of the day, they're kids. <laughs> they're kids and they need safety. They need comfort. They need protection. They need boundaries. They need all the stuff that parents provide. And 
in my experience, that stuff tends to be a lot stronger. Now, now could there be a case where a kid's coming in with a significant emotional impairment or, or significant, you know, trauma that leads to all sorts of really, yeah, for sure. I mean, that hasn't been our experience. We haven't had that kind of like crazy level. So I don't want to just dismiss anybody else's experience, but man, I just don't think that that should be a reason to keep you out of it. You know, like the fear of the unknown shouldn't be really a reason that we don't do anything in life, you know? And when, mm-hmm. when you have on one hand, I mean, let's consider the factors. On one hand, you have God telling his people, I want you to care for my kids. And on the other hand, you have fear of the unknown and what could possibly be. And I just kind of put those in both hands and say, like, weigh it out. Which one's more important? You know, mm-hmm. it's obvious every time. Do what God tells you to do and trust him and trust him. And that's, I mean, last thing I'll say, I'm, I'm rambling on this one. But like um, one thing we've learned through the adoption process is or through life process is if God calls you to something. It's just your responsibility to show up and be faithful to what he's called you to. It's his Mm -hmm. responsibility to provide the power that you need. So that was at every point of the adoption journey, we would tell, we would routinely tell God when we felt in over our heads, when we felt stressed out, we felt like we couldn't go on. It was like, you know what? You called us to this. You need to show up. And we just put the responsibility back on him, you know, (laughs) over and over again. It's like, you you called us to this. We're here, but we don't have what it takes. We need you. And, um, I think you can do that. I mean, I think you can do that with anything God called you to. But for people who feel called to adoption, I just always tell them, he called you, but he's the one that's going to provide the power. So how long have you um, been a parent for? Yeah. So our daughter is 14 years. They're biological sisters from Ethiopia. Uh, we adopted them. We got them on Christmas Day of 2007. So we're coming up on 14 years next week. Wow. And then with our son... Um, we got him on three days before Christmas, December 22nd of 2015. So we're coming up on six years with him. Mm. Yeah, just in a couple of days. Yeah. Yeah. So in these many years, I can only imagine, but uh, there's what have been some of like the biggest rewards when you think about your kids? Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, the same as any parent would say. Sorry, I'm crunching ice in the microphone. That's probably bad form, isn't it? What? I'm crunching ice in the microphone. That's probably bad form. Oh, I form. didn't hear it. Oh, good. All right. Then, yeah. ne- then never mind. <laughs> P- pretend like I didn't say anything. Yeah. Um, I mean, the same things with any parent. You know, you, you, the, the pride of watching them become, some, become who they're going to be. You know, my daughter's in college right now. 18 years old. She thinks she's an adult. Some, in some ways, she is, you know. <laughs> yeah. But it's cool. It's cool seeing That's who she's so become. Good. Like, it's cool seeing mm. what she loves and... It's cool seeing myself and my wife reflected in her personality at the same time seeing the unique person that she is and just the joy of parenting is the joy of parenting, which is why like I look at, you know, people who are worried about it being some like second best experience or, you know, one thing that I didn't address, but kind of alluded to is that parents, some parents feel like they might like, well, I love them the same as I would a biological child. And I'm like, yeah, I Mm. mean. Unless there's something really messed up somewhere, oh, of course you will. Like, they're your kids. I, that's, there's no, that's why if you talk about stigmas or like, or like um, faux pas, things you shouldn't do with adopted parents. I've done it before, but when you use language like your own kids, couldn't, you know, people will say, could, could you not have your own kids? Or when are you going to have your own kids? And I'm like, these are my kids. Mm. These are my own kids. If you want to, if you're trying to draw a distinction between them and biological, just say, could you not have biological kids? Yeah. You know, but my own kids, these are mine. Like, I love yeah. them as much as I would love anybody, as much as I can love anybody. And so, mm. yeah, I feel the, the rewards of adopting in some ways are the same as the rewards of parenting, with, 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 of just any kind of parenting. With one caveat, which I would say is, I think, and this might sound a little bit cocky, but I think my wife and I, as a result of our adoption journey, have a little bit of, a, how do I say this, <laughs> like a special insight into the gospel. Mm. You know, I, th- I think all parents, if they're paying attention, have special insight into the gospel by parenting. Like wow. you, you see in your kids, like the love you have for them is the love your father has for you. Okay. The ways that they behave toward you are the ways you behave toward him. <laughs> like you can, any parent can learn yeah. a lot, but like adoption is a massive metaphor in yeah. the New Testament for what God has done for us, how he's brought us into his family. And I think I'll always say like, because of our adoption journey, the gospel lives in our house. Like mm. every day we wake up, we're confronted by these beautiful little faces that, that, 
that show us what God has done for us. Mm. And I think that's just such a, a unexpected reward of this journey. It's that yeah. every, every time I tell him I love him, I, I just feel him saying the same thing to me, you know? Wow. Yeah. Love it, man. I, I feel like I can relate um, when you talk about, well, you were, you were mentioning Ezekiel yeah. and some other Jeremiah, yeah. Jeremiah, right? And you were mentioning how God, God's heart is for the vulnerable, the immigrant, yeah. the orphan and the yeah. widow, yeah. right? You mentioned like those four specifically. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in a sense, I, when you were saying, you know, I feel like I, I have like a extra insight yeah. into the gospel. <laughs> I, Yes. something about yes. that that I feel like it's true in, even in my life when uh -huh. it comes to I'm an immigrant yeah. right so yeah. I, I mean I decided to come here but having been having lived in the US for 16 years maybe 17 can you even remember how do you uh, look this good at 40 years old that's ridiculous shh, not a lot of coffee man <laughs> gotta quit <laughs> all right, all right. Not, not true not true more coffee more Fair caffeine enough. okay yeah. so now you're confused <laughs> I am super confused <laughs> now we don't know Uh, yeah, I'm 40, so it's been a few years yeah. since I've been here in the U.S. And the stories I've heard, again, not so much my story. I feel like I, I, my story is almost like the easier of the immigrant mm. stories wow. when it comes to living in America. Like, uh, yes, I, I mean, I had a few struggles here and there. But from what I've heard from other people, it's like, wow, all of that to be in the U.S. Yeah. Right, and I can't even believe it. And then, uh, it's—I mean, there's all kinds of immigrants, right? But really, I, I feel like people don't leave their countries for for a simple reason. Totally. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, there, there's things going on yeah, that make trauma. people go all the way to say, you know what? I'm going to cross countries. Yeah. To knock on the doors of this other place. At great personal cost, risk. Yeah, totally. All, yeah. It, even even if the answer might be i don't want you here yeah right they're willing to risk wow so i mean that says a lot about the heart of god and the gospel and it does oh, well, and the truth is like you know the truth is we're all kind of headed toward this heavenly jerusalem you know this mm. this this restored kingdom of god on earth and when we arrive there we all arrive as immigrants don't we like, we don't we don't arrive as citizens we arrive as immigrants and then god makes us citizens which is crazy we come to the we come to the gateway of the kingdom as like as outcasts as outsiders and he, he brings yeah. us in so okay same, so what, same image man yeah so what you're saying is so i picture the world and let's take out borders and countries yeah. and nationalities yeah right yes and what you have is people yes in a world and then some of these people have experienced you know a way different life than us because of maybe organized communities look different in different countries yep. right and to say that that is the heart of god like what if this is i mean i was even talking about this in another episode but w what is earth what is life yeah if it's not about caring for one another so yes. it circles back all the way to your friend saying you know something about you mentioned like relationships like something yeah, the like meaning the meaning of life is relationships yeah. meaning of life is relationships yeah Yeah, that's it, man. Like, I mean, at the end of the day, people ask Jesus over and over again, what's most important? And he says, love God with all your heart, soul, and strength and love your neighbors yourself, you know? And mm. when he's asked in the story of the, you know, through the story of the, um, why is it escaping me right now? The Good Samaritan, who's, who's your neighbor? Mm. He, he comes up with the most extreme, extreme case possible. Yes. You know, like the guy that's farthest away from you And everybody in between. So he basically wow. expands the your neighborhood to the whole world, mm. you know, and says your neighbor is yes, <laughs> you yeah. know. Yeah. And what I love too, I mean, just kind of like vamping on that story a little yeah. bit is that uh, when I hear it, it seems like we're always asking almost like the wrong questions totally. when it comes to God and Jesus, right? And just life in general. And then it's almost like Jesus flips the question is like you're asking who is your neighbor. But yeah. it's almost like Jesus says, who are you neighbor oh, totally. to? Totally, 100%. Yeah, because right? <laughs> that's what he asks at the end of the parable, right? Mm. He says, "He says now, which one was a neighbor to the man? Yes. He, so he flips it. He flips it onto the person who's asking the question and says, mm -hmm. who will you, as you said, who will you be neighborly toward? Okay, so to end, uh, my last question yeah. about adoption. 
um, what would be like the question that we need to flip? Like when people are going to Google and you know, looking up, you know, how do I adopt or how much is going to cost? Are those the helpful questions or is there a better question we can be asking mm. when it comes to this? Those are helpful, but they're secondary for sure. The, the, mm. the question that, in my opinion, we ought to ask, not just what's interesting is if you're Googling that, that other stuff, you know, chances are you've already asked the first question, which is what does God think about orphans? Mm. That's where we start. You know what I mean? Um, and that's, that's, what, that's what in our, in our story, that was the guy challenged me. Think about this, you know, or we spent some time in, in Mozambique in East Africa and saw like, this is what orphanhood means. Mm. And then you, I mean, you asked about stats earlier. Then you start to look at, so what really got us was we read the Bible, see what the Bible says. We have these experiences personally. And then those experiences make sense of the stats that you start mm. to read. And, and, you know, you start to see things like, like globally, I mean, these numbers are all really hard to wrap your head around, but globally there's 150 million orphans in the world, you know, which is huge. Like it's a massive issue, right? Until you start to look at the, at the numbers of Christians and you see that globally there are two and a half billion people who would say that they're Christians. So you see that, that, wow. so you see that we outnumber, Christians outnumber orphans 20 to 1. Hmm. You look in the U.S. and the numbers are even more staggering. You know, it's, it's really hard to know exactly. Again, numbers are hard to wrap your head around in, in this kind of a context. But like, let's say there are, I've heard some one person say there are 100,000 unattached orphans in the U.S., which means no father or mother that are essentially adoptable right now, waiting in the foster system, many of them aging out of the foster system because nobody adopts them, 100,000. Again, big number, until you realize that there are over 300,000 churches in the U.S., not Christians, churches. 300,000 mm. churches, which means that if every third church, not every third Christian, but every third church took in one, mm. there'd be no more unattached orphans in the, in, the, in the U.S. And so you look at it and you just say, I think the question we have to be asking first and foremost as Christians is, what does God think about this? Mm. Not like, what are the challenges? Not what are the costs? Not mm. what are, you know, but wow. like, what does God think? Because like I said, Oof. if you put that in one hand, that is always more important. And then if what he thinks is, I care about this, and you as my people need to care about this, then like I said, he's got to provide all the stuff. He's got to deal with the cost. He's got to deal with the, you know, <laughs> you just show up. You just say, okay, my God, my father mm. cares about this. My king cares about this. So I have to as well. Wow. And, and then, yeah, then you can Google all the other stuff. How much, yeah. is, how much does it cost? How much, you know? How much does it cost? <laughs> well, it depends. I mean, it depends. It's if you're going through the foster system. If they're going to college. Yeah, well, <laughs> oh, you're talking about the long-term cost? It costs, it costs your life. I mean, that's, the, oh, the, well, the that's truth. so good. It's just like parenting, right? I mean, yeah. it's, funny. I was thinking about oh, yeah. raising, it's funny. I was thinking about raising my kids, and obviously there was an upfront cost of the adoption, but then, of course, you feed them, and you clothe them, and you pay for their AYSO soccer, and da 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 on and on. And then my daughter moved off to college, and I just realized this year that, like, oh, I'm still paying for her. I'm paying for college. You know, we're paying for this and that. And then she's going to get married and we're going to pay for that. And, you know, it's like, no, really parenting and adoption is no different than then. Parenting is giving your life. It's not giving a year or two years or wow. it's giving your life. And that's, again, back to the gospel, right? That's what Jesus Perfect. does. That's what yeah. Jesus does. He gives his life. Love it. All right, man. So this is what we're going to do right now is we're going to end the episode with the uh, emoji reaction uh -oh. to adoption. Okay. So we're going to go through five seasons of belief. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be strange because no, I'm, I'm trying this, but... All right. So we're going to go from blasphemous to divine. Okay. Okay. So when it comes to this idea of adoption or the heart of God and adoption, what would be the worst idea the most blasphemous the the one that's farther away from god i think apathy i mean i think just turn around and walk away you know that's Ooh. that's that's what you know, remember I, I quoted sodom and gomorrah i quoted ezekiel about mm. sodom what was the sin of your sister sodom she was arrogant overfed and unconcerned wow in other words just paid attention to herself yeah and that's like Oof. and that's so i think the blasphemous the 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 i don't know if that's the word i would use but the 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 way wrong thing to do would be to hear the heart of God to read the Bible and to walk away and say eh. 
Mm. Wow, man, so good. Okay, what is the most skeptical idea or the most skeptical thing about yeah. adopting? I actually don't mind skeptical. Skeptical means you're asking good questions. Mm. Uh, and so there might be someone listening to this that will have all sorts of questions, whether they're theological questions or, um, or practical questions. And it's, you know... And there, because there are practical questions to consider. There are all sorts of things. Like, I mean, one big one is like maybe maybe there's somebody listening to this today who is feeling moved to to adoption, but they're married to someone who's not. Mm. Like, how do you deal with that? That's yeah. a real question. You That's know? good. You know, maybe there's somebody who's single who's listening to this and saying, "How do I step into adoption?" Or what is you know? So they're mm. yeah. I, I don't mind skeptical. I think skeptical is good. Because skept, if, if skeptical means you're asking questions, if skeptical mm. means that you're then you you just want to ignore it, well then you're mm. you're it goes to blasphemy. Exactly. Then. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, so it depends on where you're leaning. Skeptical is good if you're leaning in. Love it. So yeah. as we lean in, yeah, the next one would be inspired. Mm -hmm. So what's something inspirational? about adoption yeah i mean i think if you're feeling inspired um i yeah that's what that's what started for me if you're feeling inspired then just i would challenge you with the same thing my friend asked if you hear some of this and you think wow this is the first i've heard or this really makes sense to me then read read the bible i mean the bible is the inspired word of god right mm. so read the bible with an eye for the vulnerable with the eye for the fatherless and see Oof. see if like your heart doesn't change as you begin to read the inspired word of god Love it. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Okay. So the next one would be holy. Yeah. What's holy about adoption? Like I said, I think just, um, yeah. I mean, God says to his people, he calls himself throughout the Bible, and they call him the Holy One of Israel, you know? And then in different places, he says, you're to be holy like I'm holy. And I think what I would say about that is, like I said earlier, caring for the fatherless is God's priority. It's one of his like values that he puts his name on. This is who I am. I am a father to the fatherless. And he expects his people to be the same. Mm. Be holy as he's holy. Be compassionate as Oof. he's compassionate. Be just as he's just. Be a father to the fatherless as he is. Love it. Yeah. Love it, man. Ah, so good. And finally, divine. Yeah. What's the most divine? I mean, and we kind of elaborated as, as yeah. we talked about this, but... If you summarize what's the most divine idea about adoption? Well, you'll just know, you'll just know, you'll know the love of God more. Mm. Like, I don't know how else to say it, but, but if you adopt a child, the gospel will come to live in your house and you will daily be reminded of how much your father loves you. Oof. So good, man. Yeah. So good. Hey, 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 my friends, this is Beto Gudiño, El Comunicador. <laughs> Say it with me, El Comunicador. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope it was helpful. I invite you to check out ChristianPodcast.com. Check out our emoji reactions and let us know what's your reaction to this episode. How would you rate it with an emoji? And what are maybe your questions about adoption that you want to ask? Uh, if you find this helpful, maybe reach out to us, go to our website. Josh, do you have a place where you want to point people to maybe if they thinking about adoption? Oh, man. I mean, easiest thing for me would be just talk to me. Like, ah, honestly, so good. Like, How do I get, uh, get a hold me, of you? Find me on uh, our website is canopy.church. Just shoot an email to me through that. I'd be happy to chat with anybody who wants to talk about it. Whether you're local here, we'll go grab coffee or something. If you're not local get a phone call in the books or something like that. Um, but um, beyond that, I mean, there's some great resources that I know I've come across. I just can't think of them at the moment. But just start, just reach out. I'd love to chat. Love it. Thank you so much for your time, Josh. Thanks, man. Good to be with you. <laughs>